Section 13 of Library of World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fred Preston. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 4, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 13. The Waters of Death, by Erkman Chatrian. The warm mineral waters of Spinbron, situated in the Hunsruck, several leagues from Permisens, formerly enjoyed a magnificent reputation. All who were afflicted with gout or gravel in Germany repaired thither. The savage aspect of the country did not deter them. They lodged in pretty cottages at the head of the defile. They bathed in the cascade which fell in large sheets of foam from the summit of the rocks. They drank one or two decanters of mineral water daily, and the doctor of the place, Daniel Hasselnoss, who distributed his prescriptions clad in a great wig and chestnut coat, had an excellent practice. Today the waters of Spinbron figure no longer in the Codex. In this poor village one no longer sees anyone but a few miserable woodcutters, and, sad to say, Dr. Hazelnoss has left. All this resulted from a series of very strange catastrophes which lawyer Bremer of Permisens told me about the other day. "'You should know, Master France,' said he, that the spring of Spinbron issues from a sort of cavern about five feet high and twelve or fifteen feet wide. The water has a warmth of sixty-seven degrees centigrade. It is salt. As for the cavern, entirely covered without with moss, ivy, and brushwood, its depth is unknown because the hot exhalations prevent all entrance. Nevertheless, strangely enough, it was noticed early in the last century that birds of the neighbourhood thrushes, doves, hawks, were engulfed in it in full flight, and it was never known to what mysterious influence to attribute this particular. In 1801, at the height of the season, owing to some circumstance which is still unexplained, the spring became more abundant, and the bathers, walking below on the greensward, saw a human skeleton, as white as snow, fall from the cascade. You may judge, Master France, of the general fright. It was thought, naturally, that a murder had been committed at Spinbron in a recent year, and that the body of the victim had been thrown in the spring. But the skeleton weighed no more than a dozen francs, and Hasselnoss concluded that it must have sojourned there more than three centuries in the sand, to have become reduced to such a state of desiccation. This very plausible reasoning did not prevent a crowd of patrons wild at the idea of having drunk the saline water, from leaving before the end of the day. Those worst afflicted with gout and gravel consoled themselves. But the overflow continuing, all the rubbish, slime, and detritus which the cavern contained, was disgorged on the following days. A veritable boneyard came down from the mountain. Skeletons of animals of every kind, of quadrupeds, birds, and reptiles, in short, all that one could conceive as most horrible. Hasselnoss issued a pamphlet, demonstrating that all these bones were derived from an antediluvian world, that they were fossil bones, accumulated there in a sort of funnel during the universal flood, uh, that is to say, four thousand years before Christ, and that consequently one might consider them as nothing but stones, and that it was needless to be disgusted. But his work had scarcely reassured the gouty when, one fine morning, the corpse of a fox, then that of a hawk with all its feathers, fell from the cascade. Well, it was impossible to establish that these remains antedated the flood. Anyway, the disgust was so great that everybody tied up his bundle and went to take the waters elsewhere. "'How infamous!' cried the beautiful ladies. "'How horrible!' So that's what the virtue of these mineral waters came from. Oh, to a better to die of gravel than continue such a remedy. At the end of a week there remained at Spinbron 
only a big Englishman who had gout in his hands as well as in his feet, who had himself addressed as Sir Thomas Howerbirch, Commodore, and he brought a large retinue, according to the usage of a British subject in a foreign land. This personage, big and fat, with a florid complexion, but with hands simply knotted with gout, would have drunk skeleton soup if it would have cured his infirmity. He laughed heartily over the desertion of the other sufferers, and installed himself in the prettiest chalet at half price, announcing his design to pass the winter at Spinbronn. Here Lawyer Bremer slowly absorbed an ample pinch of snuff, as if to quicken his reminiscences. He shook his laced ruff with his fingertips, and continued. Five or six years before the revolution of 1789, a young doctor of Permisons named Christian Weber had gone out to San Domingo in the hope of making his fortune. He had actually amassed some hundred thousand francs in the exercise of his profession when the Negro revolt broke out. I need not recall to you the barbarous treatment to which our unfortunate fellow countrymen were subjected at Haiti. Dr. Weber had the good luck to escape the massacre and to save part of his fortune. Then he travelled in South America, and especially in French Guiana. In 1801 he returned to Permisons and established himself at Spinbronn, where Dr. Hasselnoss made over his house and defunct practice. Christian Weber brought with him an old negress called Agatha, a frightful creature, with a flat nose and lips as large as your fist, and her head tied up in three bandanas of razor-edged colours. This poor old woman adored red. She had earrings which hung down to her shoulders, and the mountaineers of Hunsruck came from six leagues around to stare at her. As for Dr. Weber, he was a tall, lean man, invariably dressed in a sky-blue coat with codfish tails and deerskin breeches. He wore a hat of flexible straw and boots with bright yellow tops, on the front of which hung two silver tassels. He talked little. His laugh was like a nervous attack, and his grey eyes, usually calm and meditative, shone with singular brilliance at the least sign of contradiction. Every morning he fetched a turn and round about the mountain, letting his horse ramble at a venture, whistling forever the same tune, some negro melody or other. Lastly, this rum chap had brought from Haiti a lot of band-boxes filled with queer insects, some black and reddish-brown, big as eggs, others little and shimmering like sparks. He seemed to set greater store by them than by his patients, and from time to time, on coming back from his rides, he brought a quantity of butterflies pinned to his hat-brim. Scarcely was he settled in Hasselnoss's vast house, when he peopled the backyard with outlandish birds, Barbary geese with scarlet cheeks, guinea hens, and a white peacock which perched habitually on the garden wall, and which divided with the negress the ad admiration of the mountaineers. If I enter into these details, Master Franz, it's because they recall my early youth. Dr. Christian found himself to be at the same time my cousin and my tutor, and as early as on his return to Germany he had come to take me and install me in his house at Spinbronn. The black Agatha at first sight inspired me with some fright, and I only got seasoned to that fantastic visage with considerable difficulty. But she was such a good woman. She knew so well how to make spiced patties. She hummed such strange songs in a guttural voice, snapping her fingers and keeping time with a heavy shuffle, that I ended by taking her in fast friendship. Dr. Weber was naturally thick with Sir Thomas Howerbirch, as representing the only one of his clientele then in evidence, and I was not slow in perceiving that these two eccentrics held long conventicles together. They conversed on mysterious matters, on the transmission of fluids, and indulged in certain odd signs which one or the other had picked up in his voyages, Sir Thomas in the Orient, and my tutor in America. This puzzled me greatly. 
As children will, I was always lying in wait for what they seemed to want to conceal from me, but despairing in the end of discovering anything, I took the course of questioning Agatha. And the poor old woman, after making me promise to say nothing about it, admitted that my tutor was a sorcerer. <laughs> for the rest, Dr. Weber exercised a singular influence over the mind of this negress, and this woman, habitually so gay and forever ready to be amused by nothing, trembled like a leaf when her master's grey eyes chanced to alight on her. All this, Master Franz, seems to have no bearing on the springs of Spinbronn. Uh, but wait, wait, you shall see by what a singular concourse of circumstances my story is connected with it. I told you that birds darted into the cavern and even other and larger creatures. After the final departure of the patrons, some of the old inhabitants of the village recalled that a young girl named Louise Muller, who lived with her infirm old grandmother in a cottage on the pitch of the slope, had suddenly disappeared half a hundred years before. She had gone out to look for herbs in the forest, and there had never been any more news of her afterwards, except that three or four days later, some woodcutters who were descending the mountain had found her sickle and her apron a few steps from the cavern. From that moment it was evident to everyone that the skeleton which had fallen from the cascade, on the subject of which Hasselnoss had turned such fine phrases, was no other than that of Louise Muller. The poor girl had doubtless been drawn into the gulf by the mysterious influence which almost daily overcame weaker beings. What could this influence be? None knew. But the inhabitants of Spinbronn, superstitious like all mountaineers, maintained that the devil lived in the cavern, and a terror spread in the whole region. Now one afternoon in the middle of the month of July, 1802, my cousin undertook a new classification of the insects in his band boxes. He had secured several rather curious ones the preceding afternoon. I was with him, holding the lighted candle with one hand, and with the other a needle, which I heated red-hot. Sir Thomas, seated, his chair tipped back against the sill of a window, his feet on a stool, watched us work, and smoked his cigar with a dreamy air. I stood in with Sir Thomas Howerbirch, and I accompanied him every day to the woods in his carriage. He enjoyed hearing me chatter in English, and wished to make of me, as he said, a thorough gentleman. The butterflies labelled, Dr. Weber at last opened the box of the largest insects, and said, Yesterday I secured a magnificent horn-beetle, the great Lucanus Servus of the Oaks of the Hearts. It has this peculiarity. The right claw divides in five branches. It's a rare specimen. At the same time I offered him the needle, and as he pierced the insect before fixing it on the cork, Sir Thomas, until then impassive, got up, and, drawing near a bandbox, he began to examine the spider crab of Guiana with a feeling of horror which was strikingly portrayed on his fat vermilion face. "'That is certainly,' he cried, "'the most frightful work of the creation. The mere sight of it, it makes me shudder.' In truth a sudden pallor overspread his face. "'Bah!' said my tutor, "'all that is only the prejudice from childhood. One hears his nurse cry out, one is afraid, and the impression sticks.' But if you should consider the spider with a strong microscope, you would be astonished at the finish of his members, at their admirable arrangement, and even at their elegance. It disgusts me, interrupted the Commodore brusquely. Pah! It had turned over in his fingers. Oh, I don't know why, he declared. Spiders have always frozen my blood. Dr. Weber began to laugh, and I, who shared the feelings of Sir Thomas, exclaimed, "'Yes, cousin, you ought to take this villainous beast out of the box. "'It is disgusting. It spoils all the rest.' "'Little chump,' he said, his eyes sparkling. 
What makes you look at it? If you don't like it, go take yourself off somewhere. Evidently he had taken offence, and Sir Thomas, who was then before the window contemplating the mountain, turned suddenly, took me by the hand, and said to me in a manner full of good will, Your tutor, Franz, sets great store by his spider. We like the trees better. The verdure. Come, let's go for a walk. "'Yes, go,' cried the doctor, "'and come back for supper at six o'clock.' Then, raising his voice, "'No hard feelings, Sir Howbert.' The Commodore replied laughingly, and we got into the carriage, which was always waiting in front of the door of the house. Sir Thomas wanted to drive himself, and dismissed his servant. He made me sit beside him on the same seat, and we started off for Rothalps. While the carriage was slowly ascending the sandy path, an invincible sadness possessed itself of my spirit. Sir Thomas, on his part, was grave. He perceived my sadness, and said, "'You don't like spiders, France.' "'Nor do I, either. But thank heaven there aren't any dangerous ones in this country. The spider-crab which your tutor has in his box comes from French Guiana, it inhabits the great swampy forests filled with warm vapours, with scalding exhalations. This temperature is necessary to its life. Its web, or rather its vast snare, envelops an entire thicket. In it it takes birds, as our spiders take flies. But drive these disgusting images from your mind, and drink a swallow of my old burgundy. Then, turning, he raised the cover of the rear seat, and drew from the straw a sort of gourd, from which he poured me a full bumper in a leather goblet. When I had drunk, all my good humour returned, and I began to laugh at my fright. The carriage was drawn by a little Ardennes horse, thin and nervous as a goat, which clambered up the nearly perpendicular path. Thousands of insects hummed in the bushes. At our right, at a hundred paces or more, the sombre outskirts of the Rothalp forests extended below us, the profound shades of which, choked with briars and foul brush, showed here and there an opening filled with light. At our right, at a hundred paces or more, the sombre outskirts of the Rothalp forests extended below us, the profound shades of which, choked with briars and foul brush, showed here and there an opening filled with light. On our left tumbled the stream of Spinbron, and the more we climbed, the more did its silvered sheets, floating in the abyss, grow tinged with azure, and redouble their sound of cymbals. I was captivated by this spectacle. Sir Thomas, leaning back in the seat, his knees as high as his chin, abandoned himself to his habitual reveries, while the horse, labouring with his feet and hanging his head on his chest as a counterweight to the carriage, held on as if suspended on the flank of the rock. Soon, however, we reached a pitch less steep, the haunt of the roebuck, surrounded by tremulous shadows. I always lost my head, and my eyes too, in an immense perspective. At the apparition of the shadows I turned my head and saw the cavern of Spinbron close at hand. The encompassing mists were a magnificent green and the stream, which before falling extends over a bed of black sand and pebbles, was so clear that one would have thought it frozen if pale vapours did not follow its surface. The horse had just stopped of its own accord to breathe. Sir Thomas, rising, cast his eye over the countryside. "'How calm everything is!' said he. Then, after an instant of silence, "'If you weren't here, France, I should certainly bathe in the basin. But, Commodore, said I, why not bathe? I would do well to stroll around in the neighbourhood. On the next hill is a great glade filled with wild strawberries. I'll go and pick some. I'll be back in an hour. Ha! I should like to, Franz. It's a good idea. Dr. Weber contends that I drink too much burgundy. It's necessary to offset wine with mineral water. This little bed of sand pleases me. Then, having set both feet on the ground, he hitched the horse to the trunk of a little birch, and waved his hand as if to say, 
You may go. I saw him sit down on the moss and draw off his boots. As I moved away, he turned and called out, In an hour, France. They were his last words. An hour later I returned to the spring. The horse, the carriage, and the clothes of Sir Thomas alone met my eyes. The sun was setting. The shadows were getting long. Not a bird's song under the foliage, not the hum of an insect in the tall grass. A silence like death looked down on this solitude. The silence frightened me. I climbed up on the rock which overlooks the cavern. I looked to the right and to the left. Nobody. I called. No answer. The sound of my voice, repeated by the echoes, filled me with fear. Night settled down slowly. A vague sense of horror oppressed me. Suddenly the story of the young girl who had disappeared occurred to me, and I began to descend on the run. But arriving before the cavern, I stopped, seized with unaccountable terror. In casting a glance in the deep shadows of the spring, I had caught sight of two motionless red points. Then I saw long lines wavering in a strange manner in the midst of the darkness, and that at a depth where no human eye had ever penetrated. Fear lent my sight and all my senses an unheard-of subtlety of perception. For several seconds I heard very distinctly the evening plaint of a cricket down at the edge of the wood, a dog barking far away, very far in the valley. Then my heart, compressed for an instant by emotion, began to beat furiously, and I no longer heard anything. Then, uttering a horrible cry, I fled, abandoning the horse, the carriage, in less than twenty minutes, bounding over the rocks and brush, I reached the threshold of our house and cried in a stifled voice, "'Run! Run! Sir Howard Birch is dead! Sir Howard Birch is in the cavern!' After these words, spoken in the presence of my tutor, of the old woman Agatha, and of two or three people invited in that evening by the doctor, I fainted. I have learned since that during a whole hour I raved deliriously. The whole village had gone in search of the Commodore. Christian Weber hurried them off. At ten o'clock in the evening all the crowd came back, bringing the carriage, and in the carriage, the clothes of Sir Howerbirch. They had discovered nothing. It was impossible to take ten steps in the cavern without being suffocated. During their absence Agatha and I waited, sitting in the chimney corner. I howling incoherent words of terror, she with hands crossed on her knees, eyes wide open, going from time to time to the window to see what was taking place, for from the foot of the mountain one could see torches flitting in the woods, one could hear hoarse voices in the distance calling to each other in the night. At the approach of her master, Agatha began to tremble. The doctor entered brusquely, pale, his lips compressed, despair written on his face. A score of woodcutters followed him tumultuously, in great felt hats with wide brims, swarthy visaged, shaking the ash from their torches. Scarcely was he in the hall when my tutor's glittering eyes seemed to look for something. He caught sight of the negress, and without a word having passed between them, the poor woman began to cry. No, no, I don't want to. And I wish it, replied the doctor in a hard tone. One would have said that the negress had been seized by an invincible power. She shuddered from head to foot, and, Christian Weber showing her a bench, she sat down with a corpse-like stiffness. All the bystanders, witnesses of this shocking spectacle, good folk with primitive and crude manners but full of pious sentiments, made the sign of the cross and I, who knew not then, even by name, of the terrible magnetic power of the will, began to tremble, believing that Agatha was dead. Christian Weber approached the negress, and making a rapid pass over her forehead, "'Are you there?' 
said he. Yes, master. Sir Thomas Howerbirch. At these words she shuddered again. Do you see him? Yes. Yes, she gasped in a strangling voice. I see him. Where is he? Up there, in the back of the cavern. Dead. Dead? said the doctor. How? The spider. Oh, the spider crab. Oh! Control your agitation, said the doctor, who was quite pale. Tell us plainly. The spider crab holds him by the throat. He is there, at the back, under the rock, wound round by webs. Ah! Christian Weber cast a cold glance towards his assistants, who, crowding around with their eyes sticking out of their heads, were listening intently, and I heard him murmur, It's horrible, horrible. Then he resumed, You see him? I see him. And the spider, is it big? Oh, master, master, never, never have I seen such a large one, not even on the banks of the Mukaris nor in the lowlands of Konanama. It is as large as my head. There was a long silence. All the assistants looked at each other, their faces livid, their hair standing up. Christian Weber alone seemed calm. Having passed his hand several times over the negress's forehead, he continued, Agatha, tell us how death befell Sir Howard Birch. He was bathing in the basin of the spring. The spider saw him from behind, with his bare back. It was hungry. It had fasted for a long time. It saw him with his arms on the water. Suddenly it came out like a flash and placed its fangs around the Commodore's neck, and he cried out, Oh, my God! It stung and fled. Sir Howard Birch sank down in the water and died. Then the spider returned and surrounded him with its web, and he floated gently, gently back to the cavern. It drew in on the web. Now he is all black. The doctor, turning to me, who no longer felt the shock, asked, Is it true, France, that the Commodore went bathing? Yes, cousin Christian. At what time? At four o'clock. At four o'clock it was very warm, wasn't it? Oh, yes. It's certainly so, said he, striking his forehead. The monster could come out without fear. He pronounced a few unintelligible words, and then, looking towards the mountaineers, My friends, he cried, that is where this mass of debris came from of skeletons which spread terror among the bathers. That is what has ruined you all. It is the spider-crab. It is there, hidden in its web, awaiting its prey in the back of the cavern. Who can tell the number of its victims? And full of fury he led the way, shouting, Faggots! Faggots! The woodcutters followed him, vociferating. Ten minutes later, Two large wagons laden with faggots were slowly mounting the slope. A long file of woodcutters, their backs bent double, followed, enveloped in the sombre night. My tutor and I walked ahead, leading the horses by their bridles, and the melancholy moon vaguely lighted this funereal march. From time to time the wheels grated. Then the carts, raised by the irregularities of the rocky road, fell again in the track with a heavy jolt. As we drew near the cavern, on the playground of the Roebucks, our cortege halted. The torches were lit, and the crowd advanced towards the gulf. The limpid water, running over the sand, reflected the bluish flame of the resinous torches, the rays of which revealed the tops of the black firs leaning over the rock. "'This is the place to unload,' the doctor then said. It's necessary to block up the mouth of the cavern. And it was not without a feeling of terror that each undertook the duty of executing his orders. The faggots fell from the top of the loads, 
A few stakes driven down before the opening of the spring prevented the water from carrying them away. Toward midnight the mouth of the cavern was completely closed. The water running over spread to both sides on the moss. The top faggots were perfectly dry. Then Dr. Weber, supplying himself with a torch, himself lit the fire. The flames ran from twig to twig with an angry crackling, and soon leapt towards the sky, chasing clouds of smoke before them. It was a strange and savage spectacle. The great pile with trembling shadows lit up in this way. The cavern poured forth black smoke, unceasingly renewed and disgorged. All around stood the woodcutters, sombre, motionless, expectant, their eyes fixed on the opening. And I, although trembling from head to foot in fear, could not tear away my gaze. It was a good quarter of an hour that we waited, and Dr. Weber was beginning to grow impatient, when a black object, with long hooked claws, appeared suddenly in the shadow, and precipitated itself toward the opening. A cry resounded about the pyre. The spider, driven back by the live coals, re-entered its cave. Then, smothered doubtless by the smoke, it returned to the charge, and leaped out into the midst of the flames, its long legs curled up. It was as large as my head, and of a violet red. One of the woodcutters, fearing lest it leap clear of the fire, threw his hatchet at it, and with such good aim that on the instant the fire around it was covered with blood. But soon the flames burst out more vigorously over it and consumed the horrible destroyer. Such, Master Franz, was the strange event which destroyed the fine reputation which the waters of Spinbronn formerly enjoyed. I can certify the scrupulous precision of my account, but as for giving you an explanation, that would be impossible for me to do. At the same time, allow me to tell you that it does not seem to me absurd to admit that a spider, under the influence of a temperature raised by thermal waters, which affords the same conditions of life and development as the scorching climates of Africa and South America, should attain a fabulous size. It was this same extreme heat which explained the prodigious exuberance of the antediluvian creation. However that may be, my tutor, judging that it would be impossible after this event to re-establish the waters of Spinbronn, sold the house back to Hasselnoss in order to return to America with his negress and his collections. I was sent to board in Strasbourg, where I remained until 1809. The great political events of the epoch, then absorbing the attention of Germany and France, explain why the affair I have just told you about passed completely unobserved. End of section 13 The Waters of Death